Hello and good evening and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club for the month of August. It's still August, yes. Um, our book this month is the fantastic Tonta. Tonta? Tonta? Tonta. Tonta. Um, and, and we have Jaime Hernandez here live in studio with us to talk about the book. Everybody love this book, right? Yeah! Thanks for the there we go. I like that. I, that's, that's the way I like to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, being willing to talk to us about, about the book and about your career. Um, you know, my first question always is, is why comics? Of all the things that you could do in the world, what is it about comics that makes it the thing you wanted to do? Uh, I get to draw and create. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just something I always wanted to do. I always liked doing, um, when I was a k tiny kid growing up, uh, I had three older brothers mm -hmm. and they read comics and then they wanted to draw comics so I just followed yeah. along what they did. Um, and they, um, and I just liked it. I was terrible at it, but, but I was a kid, you know, that's my excuse. Yeah. Um, do you have any of the comics you drew when you were a little kid still? Did, did uh, mom keep them? Or? Not, no, no. We were kind of a family that had a small house, so yeah. after a while, things just got thrown yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. um, but I kept stuff as far back as the early 70s, okay. but, but that wasn't my greatest period. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're in third grade, around that age, you're... Imagination is just yep. wacky. Those are my best comics yep. ever. Yeah, yeah. I've never drawn better comics since. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, uh, but it was yeah, it was just something I liked doing, and I and I wanted to create my superhero universe. You know, I made up because Gilbert had his, Mario had his, my other brother Richard has had his, and. I just wanted to do mine, but I had no concept of storytelling. Yeah. I, you know, I would, I would do a comic, and it would be like the Batman TV show it was pow, zam, oof, you know, yeah. and then the end, yeah. the cops taking the <laughs> one away, <laughs> you know, because I, I just had no concept of of storytelling. And um, uh, but Gilbert was good at it. He he was even if he was still doing kid comics uh he was he was really good at starting something and finishing something yeah. and i was just so envious and and gilbert was a whirlwind he was constantly creating new titles and and stuff and uh and uh, i was just like i'll draw a cover and then i don't know what's gonna go on the inside you know yeah. um was but, it a competition between you boys or was it uh, a supportive uh, it was supportive. Yeah. It was supportive, and it, but you know the competition part came where he's doing it. I want to do it too. Yeah. You know, I, I, and um, but but I knew I was I was the fourth guy. Right. You know, talent wise, and and I I just uh, wanted to keep doing it. And Gilbert and I, uh, when we were teenagers, we just started to learn how to use pen and ink and. You know, because we heard the professionals didn't use ballpoint pen. Right. You know, uh, they do now, but uh, um, and uh, I just, I just still like doing it. And when I was a teenager, I started to like doing dialogue, having the characters talk. After a while, I didn't want to create a something like a villain or anything. Mm -hmm. It was just the characters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talking and. I just I, and I guess because I grew up like on with Archie comics and stuff where and Dennis the Menace comics where it was always dialogue mm -hmm. back and forth and I just really got into that and I remember I got um I remember I really got into the book Alice in Wonderland because I loved her her arguments with the characters sure. like like her arguing with the caterpillar, yeah. you know, it was just this back and forth that I just really started to notice, and I really liked, and and so um, I don't know, and it was it was, and I was still trying to create my superheroes, but they just were not. I didn't have like sophisticated, you know, uh, ideas for mm -hmm. you know cosmic 
things going on and stuff, but I just like the characters bouncing off each other. Yeah. And I didn't really understand it. I just liked it. I liked the back and forth. And um, pretty soon, uh, when we were mid seventy, mid to late 70s, uh, you know, we discovered magazines like Heavy Metal mm -hmm. who that was reprinting French yeah. comics. And they were not, they didn't, not one of them cared about superheroes. Sure. <laughs> you know, and, and it was like, these, these kind of are free. You know, they just kind of let you like, it's kind of like, and it's like the underground comics. They yeah. just write what they want to. They don't write what they think right. you should do. And that kind of freed us. And then we got into punk and, and that really freed us mm -hmm. where it was like, you mean you guys are doing this without the permission of, of some big record company? Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is awesome. You know, I'm going to do my comics like this where I'm just going to do whatever I want. And I created a character named Maggie who uh, was supposed to be just this one character that I was going to put into real surreal stories and science fiction and, and anything. Mm -hmm. You know, put her in anything. And, uh, but as, as I started to grow older and I started, I cut my hair, you know, I, I started dressing punk and stuff. Right. So did she. She started to evolve. And, and then somewhere along the way, we're like, why are we doing stories about outer space and stuff when, why don't we do stories about where we live? Yeah. You know, yeah. and it was just like, like, oh, uh, this is way funner than a comic, uh, a usual comic I'm reading, you yeah. know, like, you know, when we go cruising on Sunday night yeah. and, and get in trouble and get drunk and, uh, and just, it was just all this stuff like, hey, our, our home life and our punk life and all this stuff and, and hanging out with our friends, that's, that's really fun, yeah. you know, and those are good, great stories to tell. They're really funny. They, um, and so that's how Love and Rockets started to uh, form. I mean, before Love and Rockets. Sure. And Gilbert and I had been trying to, uh, we were trying to break into the comics industry in a small way. Like we would do a, a drawing for a fanzine, any right. fanzine, sure, anybody sure. who said, we need illustrations, sure. send us a copy and you'll get printed. Yeah. And that's all I cared about. Yeah. I didn't know you could make money off this. And so, but then we started to write and draw our own stories with our characters. Mm -hmm. We started to do it and we're on with pen and ink and, and like, but we had nowhere to put them. Mm -hmm. And we were like, like, I want to do this, but, you know. And then one day Mario, Mario who, uh, who was a responsible adult with a family, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> raising kids and stuff, he came over and goes, what are you guys doing? What's all this work you guys yeah. are doing? And we we're like, oh, well, we we're thinking maybe the, we could print this somewhere, or someone would print print my story, my four-page story, or whatever. We we just had no concept of getting out there, you yeah. know. And uh, and Mario goes, well, I got a friend who who could get us some print, some cheap printing. Uh, why don't we just make a comic? And we were just like, oh. Okay, yeah. you know, and this was what, early, uh, like, 80, 81? Yeah. And we were like, okay, and they go, yeah, we'll make a comic, it's cool. And and we'll just have it about anything. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, and they go, hi, man, we need this many pages from you. Right. And I was like, okay, I was like, what do I got, what do I got? Uh, I got this character, Maggie, and her friend, Hopi, and I got this... And she's a rocket mechanic, you know, and, and I, so I just threw the, all this stuff together. And that's why the first issue is just a smorgasbord of, of fantasy, yeah. science fiction, uh, superheroes. Uh, kind of all your front of the mind. Yeah, 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 everything. We just threw everything yeah. in there. And... Um, and I remember showing it to friends, like we printed our own comic, but we had no concept of selling it. There was yeah. no alternative market at the time. Um, okay, so, so I have to start asking these oh, kind of questions. Okay. What, how many copies did you print? 
Do we you were, know? Like you, we were trying to print a thousand, but the wow. printer just like was just as uh, just just starting out as we uh-huh, were, uh-huh, uh-huh. and so a lot of pages were doubles. Okay. You know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so I don't really know how many turned out. I'm gonna guess something like eight hundred. Wow. Okay. Uh, copies yeah, yeah, yeah. or something. Uh, and you and you didn't necessarily know how you were going to sell them yet. No, no. Okay. I, I didn't. There was no support for an alternative outside of Marvel and DC. Right. You know, like you make a comic of where, where, where do you go? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What, where, what? You go to a store and say, "Can you sell?" Like, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know. Did, do you remember what your investment was at this? Like it was like five hundred to eight hundred dollars, something like uh, that. We or? borrowed from our younger brother. Okay. Yeah. Because he was the one with the job, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah, and he lent us the money, and we got it printed, and, uh-huh. and then we stapled it ourselves, and and did all that, and uh, and then so we decided to go. Uh, we were in Oxnard, and so we would drive to L.A. when there was a co- convention, you yeah. know, a small convention, and we would just go with stacks of them and yeah. just show people like, what do you think? You think this could sell? Yeah. And they were like, mm. like, yeah, you need color covers. Mm. You know, we were like, we can't afford that. Right. How yeah. do you get color? Right. How do you do? Co- how do you do color covers? I don't know. Mm. You know. Mm. And uh, and so we were like, like, what do we do? I guess it just sits in our house. You know. And Mario was like trying to get like a subscription thing going. Like, mm-hmm. like maybe we could. They could order from us and we'll mail it to them you know we didn't know about pricing we didn't know anything right and uh and and then gilbert was thinking like god how do we get this thing out here this thing is just sitting here yeah. and and uh and then gilbert goes why don't we send a copy to the comics journal and they'll uh, for a re- review yeah and they go, and maybe they'll hate it, but that'll be kind of free publicity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's good advertising. And so he sent it. And then, uh, like a month later or so, uh, Gary Groth wrote us back and said, we like this. You, can we print this? Neat. And we were like, what? <laughs> you know, and that was overnight. What, was just, what, what the, did he done at that point, up to that point? They They were doing the comics journal and they did a few... Thing, few comics. Was on it the still side. the Nostalgia Journal then? No, no, no. It, it, okay, it was the Comics right. Journal. This mm-hmm. was about eighty-one. Okay. And they had f- published a few small things, right. like the Flames of Gyro. Do you remember mm, that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And but they yeah. were they were uh, thinking of getting into the the comics publishing. Yeah, yeah. And they were looking for artists. Mm-hmm. We just happened to just stumble on, yeah. on it. And so ours was one of the first five or six titles they had. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so... And how old are you then? I was 21, 22. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Gilbert's what? 20... He's a, cu- a two and a half years okay, older 23, than 23, 25. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it was... And then when we... When Groth took us on, it's just been the same way since. I mean, yeah. you know, after that, it was just like, okay, we do a comic. Okay, we do the second issue now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, we got to do second issue. Okay, third issue. You know, it was yeah. just like, because that's what the pros do. You know, yeah, we, yeah. we didn't think about, like, well, we do Love and Rockets and then something else. No, right. it was like, Love and Rockets one, and then there's going to be a two. And maybe one day there'll be a tw- issue twenty. You right. know, yeah. you know, we're just so like wide-eyed and naive about the the business and, yeah. and stuff. And so, yeah. So that's how that that happened. Uh, yeah, that's pretty so, cool. That's over. Okay, we're done. <laughs> no, uh, well, um, you you didn't have any formal training. It sounds like, right? You didn't go to school mm-hmm. to learn art or anything. You no, just I I went to um, I went to community college for a little bit because mm-hmm. I was being paid to go, mm-hmm. um, and I took life drawing stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But um, no, no, it didn't didn't. It was really mostly self taught. 
yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and and studying comics too, right? I mean, it because from, from what I've read, comics were in your house. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I guess that's what I forgot to mention that comics were encouraged by her mom. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, she was a collect collector when she was a kid, um, and so comics were okay in our house. So yeah. every there was comics all the time. Yeah, and uh, um, it. Uh, I remember uh, we had this. Uh, we had the, the the Marvel comics that Mario would hoard. Mm-hmm because those were the serious comics. Mm-hmm. And then there was the Archie, Dennis the Menace, Richie Rich, Little mm-hmm. Dot comics that were for the kids, for us kids yeah. to, and we could tear the covers if, yeah. we, if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. And, and so... And were those, were those your mom's comics, the, the no, 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 by then, uh, by like late 50s, she would give Mario money to go buy. Okay. And he okay. started to collect them more and okay. more and more. And, uh, so he was kind of the gatekeeper of, you know, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we had these these bags of comics that we would, mom would let us bring out like in the summer yeah. uh, or v- vacation, yeah. you know. Um, and so we would, she'd bring out the comics and then we would just grab them and look at them. Yeah. So we were looking at mostly the same comics year after year. Right. And we would, um, and eventually the older I got, the older I'd get, I would grab the ones that were my favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I like this artist better Mm -hmm. than the Mm -hmm. other ones. I like this title better, you know. And I started to, uh, I started to differentiate the the talent, Mm -hmm. you know. Or mm-hmm. what what my taste was, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and but I would read the same comics year after year, the yeah. same issue of Betty and Veronica Summer Fun, right, or right. whatever. Um, and uh, then I remember when I when I uh, when I graduated high school from like from like eight age eighteen to till Love and Rockets mm-hmm. till early twenties, I just had this this. Th- thing in my head where I decided not to follow my brothers mm-hmm. and I and I went back to all these comics that that I I was kind of rediscovering all these comics that were my favorites you know like why do I like this guy better I like the I, I really like this artist better than that one he's not a technically better but I like the way his stories move mm-hmm. I like the way and I started to just get really get into this 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 storytelling way and and of these artists that were not taken seriously yeah. I mean these were just kid comics sure yet they had these artists that I didn't realize were real good t- they were real talented people who were just doing an Archie House style, yeah, yeah. or a Dennis the Menace style, yeah, yeah. you know. Yet um, there was something about them, and I just started to learn it. This guy, I like this guy. The way this guy tells a story, I like. Did, did Archie comics have credits in them at that point? Um, I feel like they didn't. They didn't till the late '60s when yeah. Dan DiCarlo became a, right. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. He became. Kind of Archie celebrity. Yeah. So you're so you're identifying artists by their style without even yeah I didn't having the, the tool of you know drawn by you know yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. I'd go like I like this Dennis the Menace artist better than this one but yeah. but I like them both but this guy has something going on yeah. you know and and I just went through this whole uh, Honestly, I rediscovering uh, storytelling yeah you know and I was and I, like I was saying about the Alice in Wonderland mm-hmm. thing. Like I was never a big reader, but for some reason, reading the that book over and over again, yeah. and and just like going, I like the way she argues with people. I like the way this and that, and mm-hmm. and I just start and I just started to like teach myself, you know. And I I realized it was because I was break I broke free of of copying, yeah, of, of sure, follow sure. following sure. someone else, sure. and I was just like. 
I really like this. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that that's when I kind of learned how to tell stories and, yeah. and do comics. And it was so, Love and Rockets was, came at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. If it came earlier or later, it would have been different, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. It came at maybe the only moment it could have come too, in a way. I, I'm 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 constantly struck by your career that you've been doing this for 38 years, and you've you've had little tiny forays into doing work for someone else, or mm -hmm. you drew a couple issues of Mr. X, or you right. drew some DC pages or whatever. But you keep coming back to your own thing, and you're actually making a living doing your own thing in your own way with no one telling you what or how to do it, that you recognize how exceptional that is, right? Like yeah. in terms of even, even in terms of cartoonists who you would think, you know, uh, like the car, you know, strip guys had a syndicate who, who told them, no, you can't do that storyline. Right. You can't do this storyline. No one ever told you ever. I don't think that you can't do a storyline, right? No. no. If someone tried to just not listen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I, I got the best job in the world, you know, yeah. I, I, I just, I, I'm my boss, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of think also Gilbert and I, when we were told you're going to do a regular comic now, we just said, well, professionals follow through, they, mm -hmm. They're very responsible. They they want to put out good work all the time. So we were great self editors. Yeah. You know, we were always like wanted to make sure we were free enough to tell our stories, yet find that connection. Yeah. You know, and it was really important to us that there was someone on the other side reading it. You know, so um, that kind of was our editor. You know. Yeah. 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 It also seems to me that Gary Groth's role in this is kind of can't be understated in Fantagraphics. Just giving you that freedom. Yeah. And 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 recognizing the talent and getting out of the way, you yeah. know? Yeah. That's not a thing that happens that often of of people getting out of the way. No. Yeah, um I've never really talked to him about it, but yeah, he saw something that he goes, "Oh, I guess these guys know what they want." Yeah. You know, we, we Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And so when you think about it, a lot of Love and Rockets was timing. You know, when it came out, it was timing because we found out when our comic was new that there were a lot of there were a lot of artists and writers out there that were dying to do something personal. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, a lot of them saw our work. And I'm not saying because that we started it, but mm -hmm. it was kind of like, wow, these guys mm -hmm. are doing it. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. I guess I can do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so all well, it gives these people permission to do it in a way. Yeah, you know, you see someone else. Yeah, yeah. and so mm. uh, yeah, so the timing of it was also that all these great talents were just like waiting to bust out. Yeah, you know, and I think that's pretty cool. And I think uh, it is a lot of timing. Yeah, was. yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I, I'm, I'm in awe that you got to do that in that way. I, I've talked to so many cartoonists, and you know, not everybody. Ha You've just had such a sweet flight path. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic. You know, I mean, I'm sure plenty of struggle well, all the way sure. through, but sure. it's, it's just, it's just great that you're able to do what you want, how you want to, in the way that you want to. I, uh, I I'm kind of in awe of that. Um, you you go back and forth between soap opera, melodrama, and in a book like this, comedy. Um, obviously, a lot of that is your roots. Uh, reading Archie comics mm -hmm. is is a lot of that, I'm sure. Is it when you produce work? Do you do you need to alternate, or how do you how do you decide what kind of a project a, a book's going to be? Did that make sense? Uh, it, it's uh, where the story is going. Okay. If the story is like doesn't have a happy, a funny subject, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna 
I'm not going to screw with that. Right, you right, know, right. I'm going to do it total, total straight, straight faced. Um, I never, I never have. Um, I don't know how you put it, but I have. I have never talked down to my audience. Mm -hmm. I've never tried to. I've always, I, and or or the material. I mm -hmm. always thought I'm going to treat this goofy, silly st story uh, as seriously as something mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. I'm really serious about. Yeah. You know, it's all kind of like all of it is straight face. None of it is like, look what I did. Click, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I never liked that uh, that cheating sure. the audience kind of sure, thing. Sure, sure, sure. I I always expected my readers to to be able to take it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I kind of so in a way I respected them as I hoped they would respect. Yeah. Do you me. are you writing stories for yourself or do you actually picture an audience? Um. I it's it's both because I I really do I try to write where I include the audience. Mm -hmm. I give them enough information but sometimes just enough where they can make up their own minds yeah. about things. If someone comes up to me and tells me they hate a character, I'm like, "You're right." Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I it's if if you you hate them, that's understandable because that's your, what you saw yeah, yeah. in it. You know, um, yeah. It's uh, I mean, of course, if the certain information I'm giving has to be taken a certain way to sure. get to get the story across. But um, as far as uh, characters, you know, if they don't like somebody. They don't like somebody, yeah. and and that's their, and that's totally their opinion. And I totally respect it, you yeah. know. And uh, so, I like I like including the reader in my comics. I really l try to to give them just as much fun as I'm having, you yeah. know, kind of like like and say almost, yeah. you know, without them telling me how to what whether to kill a character or not. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just love that connection, you know, yeah. that, that they're involved too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, what's, your, what's your process like in terms of you've got a blank page and you've got to fill it? Sometimes it stays blank a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Where does it start? It, you, usually, it starts with an idea as I'm grocery shopping. Okay, you know, I'm thinking about uh, something like Maggie hasn't been in a, the best of moods lately, mm -hmm. or or this person hasn't is really kind of going through a tough time. What if where if I sent them to the store, how would they act? Mm -hmm. How would they treat it? Would they just be pissed and knocking over things? Yeah. Or, or you know, or uh, or how would they treat someone greeting them? Mm -hmm. You know, because right now this person's in a funk or or something. It's, it's usually like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare. It's rare that uh, I have an actual concept. Mm -hmm. I have a story to put the characters in. It's usually the story goes into the character. Okay. I mean, it's usually the character writes the story. Okay. Um, Does it start with a scene, though, or...? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes I want someone to be uh, sitting on a roof talking mm -hmm. to someone on the ground. Mm -hmm. as simple as that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I want, like, okay, I want, I want Maggie to be wearing... Uh, be bundled up because it's cold outside. All right, it's cold. Where's she going? You know, where, where, where's that leading her? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just stuff simple as that. If I want to make her wearing a certain hat, why is she wearing that hat? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's sometimes it's the simplest things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes it's uh, uh, I have uh, 
something in mind like a current event or something. And I think from there. But um, I've never been a brainstormer. I've never been an idea person. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say 90% of the time the characters write the story. Okay. Because I, uh, if I waited for a concept, the thing would never come out. Sure, sure. You know. And so you start sketching. You start. I start usually writing, writing on a pad. Okay. A pad. Okay. Walks into a room. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Nothing. What's wrong? Nothing. Leave me alone. Okay, you're pissed. You know. But by the time it gets to the comic, sometimes that's taken it completely out. Sure. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but you're so you're not you're not starting it from a visual. Well, you may have a visual in mind. Yeah. But you're not you're not starting on the page from a visual place. You're starting on the page from the word. Yeah. Yeah. But with okay. a setting, sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes not a setting, just a room. Mm -hmm. And then that room becomes a school mm -hmm. room or something, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. uh, someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, lay, lay, as the story starts to develop. Um, so. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's always different, though. I mean, it's always like my approach is always different. Why? That's why I could never teach this stuff mm -hmm. because it's just just circling in my head, and something comes out. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So uh, when I'm ready to go to put it on the page, mm -hmm. I. I take the script and I start writing it. Okay. I start writing the balloons, and I have kind of have an, an, a visual in my head. Mm -hmm. But I will, uh, I will like, um, I will start editing the balloons. Right. Like they don't need to say this. He already said it here. Mm -hmm. Or why don't I just add that information? Here. Maybe the information should go before he says that. Maybe he should say no instead of yes. You know, it's it's sure, sure. so I'm constantly I'm my page is a mess, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like mm -hmm. notes all over the mm -hmm. all over it. And um Are you doing any drawing yet at this point or is it still uh, all sometimes. Okay. Sometimes I'm not, sometimes yeah. I am. Um I'm just trying to picture it, that's all. Yeah. Um the page is like just this mess erased mm -hmm. stuff and, and I'm moving panels over mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I didn't need that one panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, I don't know how it turns out in the end. You know, I don't know how I, I got there. By the time the story is finished and I'm done drawing it, I don't remember that I went through all that trouble. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a mess. And but my head knows. Uh, I've just learned how to make it make sense. Okay. Communicate. So it, it, it sounds roughly to me. I mean, tell me how I have this wrong. That you're that you you're writing and then you're refining, and editing and discarding and moving on the writing, and then you start drawing after that. Once you've got it, kind of set as a set of dialogue sure. choices. Sure. Is that is that kind yeah. of close? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I will have uh, certain characters in certain angles, uh, you know, because sometimes for the, sometimes the balloon tells them where to stand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, they tell the balloon where to stand, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> where yeah. to go. You know, sure, of course. You know, so it's it's always uh, it doesn't look like anything till I'm confident in in the flow. And but there's been times where, where I started penciling and I penciled this whole page, and then I'm ready to letter because yeah. lettering is the first bit of inking I sure. put on. And I'll go, and I'll start lettering lettering it, and I'll go. I don't like this. Mm. <laughs> it's not working. It's not mm -hmm. flowing. Mm -hmm. It's not. And and so I go, I drew this whole. Page in pencil. Yeah, and I'm like, all right, get out the light board, you know, and I just trace the images yeah. and move the panels around right. and, and change the the dialogue. And sometimes I've done that three times over. You yeah. Know? Um, 
I what, what kind of units are you working with typically when you're are you like sort of working in 10 pages at a time or, or you I would do you say, see what I mean because yeah. because everything's serialized first yeah um, I I usually have about three or four pages okay that and then I come to a block mm -hmm. and so I start drawing it and then I'm thinking about yeah. I'm thinking about what's going what's yeah. coming yeah you know yeah yeah okay I can see yeah. this yeah and then sometimes I write a whole story from front to end yeah. and I'm happy yeah you know but it you never know I mean it's always it's never the same yeah yeah you know and like these the stories in here started out as like here's a funny four pager here's a funny six pager mm -hmm. here's this next one kind of has a more serious mode because those stories before st starting to lead this somewhere something's not right or right. something you know so um so and then by the time i've got a hundred pages i've turned it's kind of like like oh i planned this all mm -hmm, <laughs> along but mm -hmm. i didn't really sure you know yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, and this is over what five, six, seven issues, right? Yeah. 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 So that's a year and a half, and it's coming out at the time that you're still doing it. So it's very difficult to keep that in your head as a sure. as a plan in a way. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I have to I have to reread the older stuff. Oh yeah. The, yeah. Do you the issues yourself before a lot? Yeah, I yeah. have to reread it over and over. Yeah. And go what? Okay, how's this gonna flow? How's this gonna? How's this gonna work? How often do you hit? Uh, oh, oh, oh! I messed up. Oh, I need to. Oh, oh. all the time. Really? I've, okay. I've. Um, you hide it well. That's the thing. Yeah. I I have written some of my best stories from mistakes because I screwed up on a little bit of information, and I went, oh. And I go, okay, how do I fix this? Like, like uh, the Love Bungler story, yeah. uh, the Brown Town story in it. Uh, I, I had this, I wrote this story about Maggie visiting her family. And she visited her, her uh, three brothers and a sister. And I go, okay, Maggie's got five, uh, five, so kids, nice. kids in the family, you know. So I was like, "Oh, good, okay, I'm happy." I just happened to look at a really old issue, way from way back in the beginning, and I was just looking at it like, "Oh, I haven't looked at this one in a long time." And someone's talking about Maggie having six, and I just went, <laughs> "I went, oh man, six, okay, 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 okay." In the story I'm doing about her and the five siblings, I'm going to put in this part where they talk about the brother that that left, that ran away. Right. You know, see, there was six. Okay. <laughs> and so I created her brother Calvin, who was, uh, who I just, I had them talking about him, and he said the... Oh yeah, Calvin, who who ran away because he got a girl pregnant or or something. So I go, okay, Calvin was trouble. Mm -hmm. Calvin was trouble. That that I do know about mm -hmm. this guy. Mm -hmm. What? How did he get in trouble? How did how did he separate from this unit? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. why why was he the only one who split? And so I just it had it in the back of my head for a long time, and I went. And then in that same old story that said she had six, they talked about where Maggie and her family moved away for three years. Mm -hmm. Maggie moved away. And I was like, I wonder what happened. You know, they moved away for three years and then she came back. And then I was, and then I was thinking, what? You know, and I always thought, what happened to her in those three years? What? They moved to a desert town in the California desert. And I was like, okay, what do what it? And then I, I realized, how old was Maggie? And I did the math. Mm -hmm. okay. She was 10 to 13 years old. That's a big time. 
in a young person's life, mm -hmm. going from 10 years old to 13. And I go, okay, so something happened. Yeah. Something happened. And so I started to put it together in my head as I was doing other stuff. I was just going, okay, so, so there was something that happened in that three years. Okay. And so I ended up writing the, so the story Brown Town, mm. which was one of my favorite stories I ever wrote. I know it was all because of the screw up. Yeah. You know? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Do you, how, 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 how real is Maggie? Does she have an existence that's somewhat outside of your own? Yeah, I know where she lives. Yeah. You know. Not, not exactly the street or anything, yeah. but yeah, she lives in the San Fernando Valley. Um, you know, uh, I know when I'm doing a story about Hopi or yeah. doing a story about another character, yeah. I know Maggie's living somewhere. Yeah. While this is happening, she lives somewhere out there. Right. You know. And that's the way I think about the characters that they're that they're always they're always around. They're just not there at the moment. Have you had a situation where you think, as an author, oh, the scene needs to go this way, but the characters are like, oh well. yeah. Well, since they write themselves, it's yeah. hard. It's hard yeah. to to stop them yeah. from doing something. Um, yeah, sometimes we get in arguments. You know, if you want to call it that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I, I treat them like real people because it just makes me uh, know them, mm -hmm. know them better. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, I can write. I can write a story like that. I'm setting up for, let's say, Hopi, and I go. No, Hopi wouldn't let this story continue because she would stop. Right. Stop it right there. Right. She's not afraid to yeah. to yeah. to make things end right there. So, who would do it? Maggie's weaker. Maggie would be afraid to yeah. to to uh, stop what's going on, and she would get in more trouble, more trouble, and it would become a longer story. Yeah. Sometimes it'd be like, yeah, but she's a bit acting too. She's not acting exactly how Maggie would act. Sometimes that works because it's like, wow, Maggie, that's you? Wow. But sometimes it's like, no, maybe a different character would work better. Yeah. Better than this. And so I write, I put the other character in, and then the story just blossoms, you know? And so uh, it's having a good arsenal of characters uh, that I know so well, yeah. you know, I can just. If I'm stuck on something, or if I want it to go a certain way, I, I can just replace them yeah, yeah, every time. Yeah. yeah. I have I have a lot of more questions, but I do. I'm literally about to turn to the audience right now with you with your hand up, Raza. Please, please ask that question. I was just curious when you uh, came up with the idea of aging the characters. Was was that was that accidental, or was it conscious, or? It was kind of conscious. You know, Gilbert used to talk about that in the beginning of Love and Rockets, he wanted to age his characters because he really liked the comic strip Gasoline Alley, which aged their characters over over 40 years yep. or whatever. Um, but I saw, I went back and looked at some old drawings I did pre-Love and Rockets, and I have little charts of Maggie growing old where I draw her certain age and I give, and I write down the age. So I guess it wasn't, I guess we were thinking about that before. Right. You know. Um, it was, uh, it was just something we wanted to do because um, uh, because growing up with family and 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 aunts and uncles and grandparents from the old country, we always had this sentimental thing about past, the past of, of these, like, when my mom was a kid collecting comics, when, you know, and then like, oh, remember our uncle's house that we used to go to when we were little? And I was, I felt this way when I was like six years old. I felt like, 
remember the old days, which was like a year before, <laughs> before or whatever, but we would always talk about, remember when we were little and we used to go to Theo Lalo's house and this and that, and, and remember, you know, this, and there was just something really warm about it. And then also the, the, the relatives telling us stories about their past, about growing up. My mom used to love to talk about growing up barefoot poor, but she said it was the best life ever, you know. It, it was just, and she just made it sound so cool. And so um, we, we found out by aging the characters that gave them a past. It gave them a past, and it al almost gave them a future, kind of. And so uh, it kind of helped a lot more than we thought, you know, because we just, uh, just like, you know, I, could, I can look at a really, the first issue of Love and Rockets and go, oh my God, they're babies. We were all babies then, you know, even me, <laughs> you know, and it's just a, a warm feeling to me that I try my best to, to give to the reader without the syrup being <laughs> poured on it, you know, you know, and, uh, so yeah, the the aging thing, I, it was a mixture of reasons, but um, it worked out for the better. I also imagine that your interests as a as a creator change over time, and you don't necessarily want to still be writing wacky teenage hijinks, right? You know, right into your fifties. You know, there's just a point where life becomes about different things, yeah. and which brings up Donta. Yeah. When I decided to do teenagers again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I realized I have no idea how teenagers <laughs> talk anymore. <laughs> and I would try to listen to my daughter talk, uh -huh. and I go, "No, she's not saying any. She's not saying anything different than I did. I don't." And then she'd say some slang, and I just go, "All right, I don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is." Yeah. You know, and so. It's it's really hard to disguise the fact that a 50, 55 year old man is writing uh, sixteen year old kids, right. you know, and it's uh, but it's it's funny like when I d have them say things, I go, oh my god, I'm doing like the dead end kids in nineteen thirty nine, you know, they're like they're like. <laughs> They're like gutter tramps from the Depression era. <laughs> you know? And so I have to be careful. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. okay, they, they're not going to use so much slang. They're just yeah. going to talk. I mean, do you ever go to your daughter and ask her to read it? So, uh, no, she's not interested. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It like at all? It didn't pass. Yeah, me. okay. There okay. was a few times where she was like, I want to read your stuff. Yeah. But she wasn't old enough yeah, yeah. at the time. Yeah. And then now that she's old enough, she doesn't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but that's all right, you know. But I mean, she she grew up on some comics, but for some reason, mine she's not yeah. not interested. You can't expect it's gonna pass like a gene necessarily, right. or a virus. I don't know which one <laughs> quite it is. Questions, people. Oh, seriously, we got Jaime Hernandez. There we go. Uh, so many questions. Um, I feel like one of the things that you're strongest at is the way that you use sh shading and light, and, and, and especially given that you work in black and white. Um, it, how did you develop that skill? Because that's, like a, I feel like, a supremely difficult thing to pull off. Um, part of it, I mean, you know, learning from other old cartoonists and stuff, but... Another thing was, uh, since our comic was black and white, we did a black and white comic because it was economical, not because, because we thought it was artistic, you know. Um, so I just learned, I just knew that we didn't have color, so it was like, well, I'm going to have to learn how to color this with black and white. And so that's where I learned to spot blacks and, and, and stuff and... and shading and stuff like that because uh you know i wanted to look pretty you know and, and you know yeah. somebody came earlier with a poster printed out from one of your pages from from 83 at poster size and i was really struck by just how much 
cross hatching and and you know it was all it was all I'm trying to fill in all the 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 space you know I don't quite know how to do it you know and the simplicity and kind of elegance of your line now I, I, I do you find that less is more when you're yeah yeah I it's kind of like um, one line is doing the job of hundred lines mm -hmm. you know. Um, also, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, crosshatch, you want me to crosshatch? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, I love it. It's a, it's a balance. You know, I, I, try, I compromise with myself constantly. Sure. You know. Sure. Both you and Gilbert, um, I feel like your stories primarily feature female antagonists. Um, and I'm curious as to why that might be. Um, but also, you guys are fantastic at writing women, which is a a difficult thing, maybe for a guy uh, who's trying to write comics. Um, but so, why are women generally the such prominent characters in your comics, and, and how do you go about writing them in a way that feels so authentic? Yeah, um, I don't know. I, it's just something I've always liked doing. You know, um, ever since I I tried to draw women when I was young. You know. Um, which I was like, mom's gonna kill us for drawing, <laughs> for drawing women, you know. Um, it it was just something I I liked doing, and I I got no real answer for it other than I I love women. I I like women for a hundred different reasons, you know. Um, and I just feel very comfortable doing women characters, you know. One, you know, there's so many so many answers. One of them is partly that when I was younger, um, I realized that the more women were, were willing to show emotion out, outright than most of the men I knew. And I liked the emotion in the comics. I liked, I liked people to, to go as far as they could, you know, with uh, feelings. And stuff, and you know, I've just always known guys, including myself, who just keep it in and try to try to be brave and stuff like that. And and I've just known a lot of women over the years who are like, "Fuck that! I'm gonna cry. Fuck, you know, that's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm getting this out. You know, the way I know how." And I really like that. And I so the characters writing those characters kind of just kind of freed me to uh, go as far as I could. Uh, you know, to, then there's other answers, like I like drawing women, obviously, huh. you know. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just a, something that, that felt right. And, um, and the first time a woman approached me about my comics and said, I really like the way you do women, I would go, Whew, good. <laughs> Good. I get to continue. Yeah. You know, I'm 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 on the right path here. You know, yeah. so. I think one of the things that's fantastic is that you draw women as they are, not idealized. You know, so much comic art is. Sometimes I idealize. No, uh, absolutely, no, absolutely, but not not all the time. And right. so much comics art is just nothing but idealized. Well, so, I, okay, I got I got to admit this. Um, sometimes it's getting my cake and eat it, eating it too. Sure. I like the natural things of women. Mm -hmm. I, it's, some of it is a turn on. Mm -hmm. You know, the more realistic I, I approach a drawing of a woman is a turn on sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, it is like, oh, I like this. I like drawing this. I mm -hmm. like the gravity. I like the, mm -hmm. this. I like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like I never, I was never pleased. I was never pleased when I did a pinup of a perfect right. woman. Right, right. I would draw it and I would go, okay, good, the curves are there, you know, everything everything is in place. I don't know who that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, she's, she, I, I, I got to give her a, character. I got to give her a life mm -hmm. in order for me to fully 
appreciate what I put down. Yeah. You know? And I don't know. It's just something that I just always had, yeah. always felt. Um, I wasn't happy with just a drawing. It's hard for me to just do an image. Yeah. Unless I know that image. Yeah, that makes you know. sense to me. In the back. Well, first of all, muchas gracias, Jaime. Thank you very much for giving us this amazing work. Uh, I'm from Venezuela, so I came to your writing, to your book, to kind of relate my life. I didn't grow up here in the United States. Uh, so that was two, in 2005, I came here to live and whatever. I get to your book. So the first uh, encounter that I have with your book was with the trilogy, um, uh, uh, Maggie the Mechanics, you know, and then the Girl from Hoppers, and finally Bella, La Loca. And uh, uh, even though pretty much all your books are pretty much what I have read so far, because then I came back to Venezuela, whatever, I'm now here. I get a question of, uh, because you all are knowledge about, knowledgeable about all these characters, you know, uh, Maggie and Hoppy and Nisi and of course Rena Titanion, which pretty much epitomized everything, the fantastic world of uh, uh, Lucha Libre, I you say, restaurant? Mm -hmm. yeah. Lucha Libre. However, there's a character that I kind of worship and love, and it's, uh, it's Penny Sentry. You know? So, yeah, she's awesome. Because, uh, She's kind of, it's like a wild beast, you know, and sometimes I even see that she's kind of a, the superhero that you want to draw at the beginning of your, you know, your, uh, your beginnings. That's a, everybody wants to have a, a superhero, okay? But she's actually the only one who uh, asked Mr. HR, right, to, since she's a billionaire, to turn her into, an, into a freaking superhero, you know, and she's dreaming about that. But in some, somehow she's, she becomes a superhero because she's always like <coughs> has this kind of Teflon syndrome that nothing does her, nothing affects her, and she's kind of always, you know, the one who beats them all. So can you give me your, I mean, when she was born, who is Penny Century? <laughs> well, in the beginning, Penny, Penny Century was kind of left over from my... Uh, my science fiction world before Love and Rockets, that, that she'd be in outer space, you know, in a little tight outfit or whatever. Um, um, she, uh, I threw her into the comic. Um, she became one of Maggie and Hopi's friends, but there was something separate about her that, that, while they lived on the earth, she didn't seem to live on the earth, you know, with them. She didn't seem to fit. So I decided to think of her as um, she was this this comic book drawing that they cut out and paste and planted on earth and to see what happens. She hung out with Maggie and Hopi. They think she's crazy because she's this weird, weird thing person. Um, so I kind of ran with that, that Penny kind of is like, she's not of this earth, but without explanation of like, well, what planet does she come from? No, just she's just this, this interesting character that doesn't fit, yet she fits. As the character developed, I started to make her more human and more human and I started to write her past and stuff. That wasn't intentional. I just started to know her more. I just started to understand that, well, maybe she does fit. Maybe the more I know her, the maybe she, do, she does fit. But I kind of still liked the part that she just doesn't cooperate with the way things are, you know? And I kind of like that, you know? I created a character after her, uh, Vivian, the Frogmouth, um, as kind of the same thing, but more more human. Meaning, this person, this person is a mess. This person is wrong. This person is just not likable. Well, guess what? Here she is. You guys take take it, <laughs> take her how how you want. But I love like Penny. I like her freedom. I like that she can make any decision. It's the wrong decision, but it works. You know, and I just like she's just a 
she's just a knife in everybody's back. And I kind of like that trouble about her. And that's, Penny was the nice version of that. She's the not so nice version of that. Yet she is, but I have, I have had fans, women fans, who just go frog mouth. Oh, she's the best because she's just ruining everything. <laughs> you know, and so it's, it's just fun, you know, fun stuff. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Another one, yeah. So, um, getting back to Tontan, I mean, I grew up in Mexico City, you know, and so we all had nicknames, you know, and they were pretty brutal. I mean, so there's, there's this, you know, sort of overt brutality in some of the, obviously in all, some of your stories, but obviously in that nickname. I mean, as I said, growing up in Mexico, I mean, I still call, I have like two or three friends that they were a little fat when we were kids, and they were El Gordo, and I still call them, what's up, Gordo? And then, yeah. And then I had one was short, and you're like, what's up? And I know, and I still want to come, I call him up on my phone. My daughter, my other daughter, she's like, I'm on the phone, I killed my nano. And my, and my daughter's like, I, I hang up, he's like, I can't believe you called me, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Midget, I guess, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so that means, so what's, uh, what was up with the sort of overt uh, brutality in the nano? Um, the, uh, the, the, this, the fucked upness of life, you know, the, the, She's got that label, and you find out that she prefers it over her, over her yeah. real name. But um, Tonta, well, I was called Tonto my whole life, you know, as a kid. I thought don't, I, I was called it so much that I thought it meant uh, bad, like I was bad. I didn't know it meant I was stupid, you know. And when I found out, it was, I remember uh, my brother, my sister-in-law, she... Uh, half Colombian and one time I went I don't and she went she looked at me with the death stare and I went what I say what I say all I was saying was you're bad and then I realized oh it doesn't mean that all these years it means stupid and it's like an this insult you know and I go so that's what I was called all these all these years and uh, <laughs> So, you know, the Lone Ranger's partner is stupid, you know, that's fun. <laughs> um, but um, I just thought it was a good name because she's stuck with this curse of, of this name, but owns it, you know, like, no, I'm tonta, I'm, I'm all the way, you know, yeah. Very much so. <laughs> Seth? Sure. Um, there's a lot that I want to ask you, but I, I, I think one of the things that I love about your story is, is that I can go back and read the older ones and they feel, they feel a little timeless. Um, they feel like they could have come out five or ten years ago and they were actually, you know, 30 years old. Um, and it's interesting because usually in, in stories like yours, done by other people, there are ideas or tropes or, or even you know, uh, uh, things that show up in the art that tie them to a specific period. And that doesn't quite seem to be the case with yours. Uh, not quite so literally or physically. And I'm wondering if you do that intentionally or if, um, if you come to it the way you say you come to the rest of it. Um, it's, it's a mixture uh, of it. Um, sometimes I don't put specific timelines because they're supposed to be growing up in real time mm -hmm. well uh, the story I, I just did uh, is this how you see me happens in two nights and it took me three years mm -hmm. to do so how old are they <laughs> you know are they current or are they or, the, or did this happen back in... So, so uh, you know, I work slower than real time. So, I mean, or my characters, you know. Sure. So I try not to put a lot of current things in it because I'm not sure exactly what year that story happened. It could have been five years ago or a year ago, and but I can't. I, 
I, it's hard to do the math sometimes, you know. You're lucky um, that the punk scene hasn't changed much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I try to keep things that are timeless, okay. like like you were saying. Um, um, part partly also because uh, sometimes current events in comics and stuff kind of spoiled it for me, you know. Uh, it was like, okay, so you're putting into their world something from our world that kind of that sometimes that would i don't know it just didn't didn't uh work for me you know um i preferred i prefer them to have their own problems i guess you know uh i don't know i don't know it's it's like i said it's a mixture of a lot of different things i'm you know i'm i'm a person I'm five guys in my head arguing all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, well, do you do it that way? No, well, I'm not going to do it that way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. So um, the first issue of Love Rocks that I took was the issue with flies on the ceiling, and I just remember reading that as a teenager. Blowing away, it's still to me one of the best comic stories ever done. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of because it has a very distinct narrative style, uh, much more sort of structured and mm -hmm. you know, even panels. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your influences for that story and also a little bit about Izzy. It's it's funny you mentioned that because uh, that story I was talking about earlier where Maggie was gone for three years, she had six kids. In that same story, they talk about. And then my sister went to Mexico, and then she became she came back a weirdo, and I was like, uh, I would go to, I would do comic signings, I would go to comic shows and stuff, and people would go, what happened to Izzy in Mexico? And I go, uh, you'll see. I had no idea, <laughs> you know. So I thought about it. It was in the back of my head, like usual. It was just in the back of my head. One time I'm going to see why. Izzy changed, you know, when she went to Mexico. And then uh, years passed, year, like 10 years, and I was like, okay, uh, I'm almost ready to do this. Okay, she's going to go to Mexico, and she's just going to have a life-changing thing. What would be the life-changing thing, you know? And I was like, okay, so she goes to see, she goes and I was going to make it this long, really long, drawn-out saga of uh, Izzy in Mexico and, and just these life lessons and stuff like that. Uh, by the time I, I just edited it down, edited it down, I just, I just went, all right, now I'm going to tell the story in 15 pages. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it, and I'm going to. I'm not going to explain a lot of things. I'm just going to show through her eyes what's going on. And I had the best time. And I was like, oh, I get to do horror. Okay. Yeah, it's fun. It was just so fun to do it like that. And just like, OK, this is why. And that's, that's partly where I realized, no, I'll let the reader tell me what it means. I'm just going to put it out there you know I'm just gonna do it so um, so it's kind of like it's up to you what happened to her <laughs> you know what 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 cha changed her I mean obviously it's her love affair with the devil but you know is it is it or is it more than that is it less than that you know I I just love playing playing that way I mean the easiest thing and the most playful thing to me is just doing like horror or uh, or something like that it's just so easy like all right that what other weird thing can i ever do you know so uh that that i so in the end i decided that the the thing that changed her was guilt you know because that's what the story is about that she she had so much guilt that she invited the devil into her into her life and and I go, that's what it's about, <laughs> you know. And I did that, and I just had the, I had the funnest time. And it's one of my favorite stories. And people, 
people have told me how much they love it and stuff. And I go, good, good, this is fun. Yeah. Having fun with tragedy, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Do you think of the characters in color? Or, like, when you do the covers, is it, like, do you have to make certain decisions that you weren't thinking about when you were drawing the stories? Because sometimes I'm really surprised to see the colors of things on the covers. Oh. You know, because the, the books are black and white, and so, yeah. Oh, um, I guess mostly is like, how do people coordinate colors with their clothes? Because I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know how uh, fashion works and doesn't work and you know so I'm, I'm doing a cover and I'm like okay she's wearing a red top what would her skirt look like you know okay she's wearing a I'll make it a black skirt <laughs> you know um, so yeah it's mostly I I I don't I've never trusted my uh, color template in my head my palette I've never, I've never learned how to match colors and stuff. So that's why covers of mine are usually very bright. And it's because I'll say, okay, she's wearing a red top. Okay, I haven't used any blue. Where can I put some blue? <laughs> you know, and I'll go, I haven't used yellow or green. Okay, where's that going to, you know, and I usually do it that way. And luckily it's, it's never turned out to a, that much of a disaster, but sometimes it's <laughs> it's hard. I don't. I, l I look at a lot of the the new colorists, how they have this palette of a million browns, yeah. you know, and I'm just like, how did you do that? Yeah. God, I wish I I wish I knew. But um, yeah, so a lot of it's just trial and error, <laughs> you know. You um, you work. Uh, I'm assuming purely on on paper. There's no. There's not. You're not doing oh, anything no. digitally no, or no. Yeah. 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 I still do the old style. Yeah. Uh, pencil, then ink. Yeah. You know. And original art is. Eleven by fourteen. Yeah. So not that big. Okay. Yeah. But. Okay. So actually, not too far from. Yeah. Yeah. About. Okay. So big. Yeah. Okay. And that, that was because uh, <laughs> when we were starting to do comics and learning like, well, the pros use pen and ink, okay, uh, uh, and they use this kind of paper. They don't use typing paper, you know, um, and they draw 10 by 15. I'm like, oh, well, okay, 10 by 15. If you see the early issues of Love and Rockets, it's magazine size with these white big borders yeah. because we, we didn't, we had no idea, yeah. you know. And then, uh, then we learned like, oh no 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 no! If you uh, if you widen it, then it'll fit on the page better. And so I would buy this tablets of Bristol board. They were eleven by fourteen, yeah. and I'd go, okay, shrunk down. That makes it magazine size. Okay, good. So I never thought of you drawing big. Mm -hmm. I never thought of. So uh, it's just everything just came by. Convenience and accidents, you know, yeah. like, like, oh well, this is what I got. Here I go, gonna make a comic. This, but you know? to me, this makes the cleanliness of your line that much more impressive because so much of of you know cleanliness in in, in a lot of uh, creators is because it's shrunk down half size. Right. You know, right. Right. <laughs> it right. cleans up real nice when you do that. You know, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. It just just turns out. <laughs> to piggyback off the black and white color question, um, you know, there's been <coughs> stories over the years and articles where you guys have said you probably wouldn't want to do like a TV show or a movie type thing, or or you've been approached, but it was never quite the right vision to bring this stuff to life. Um, what's the latest on that, um, since we are in kind of a golden age of serialized television right. and, and film? And if that were ever to be the right situation for you all, would it be black and white or would it be color? Ooh. Well, we, Gilbert and I have been doing the Hollywood talk for almost as long as we've been doing the comic. And uh, uh, right now, Gilbert has something that's just about, just about ready to go. Um, so he has something going. I gave up. I, I gave up compromising and 
failing and writing, uh, trying to write my own script, and then the, they're like, well, this ain't a script. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, and and then all the promises and all, and all that stuff, and so for me, I I, I just gave up, and I, I just go. I I'm a much happier person drawing my comics. You know, I own, there's only one one technical person working. You know, a set of hundred people, <laughs> um, but. Um, but, you know, I go to the movies and then they show the previews, you know, before the movie. And sometimes I picture, like, Daffy's big face on the camera and, and she's like bright, bright blonde hair, spiky hair, and her wearing her leather. And I'm just like, yes! And, and then I go like, nah. Too much work. Too much compromising. You know? but, but, yeah, Gilbert, Gilbert's been... Uh, working on Happy something. Happy to compromise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think Gilbert's finally taking the money and running. Mm. You know, he's just like, okay, do do my stuff. Just give me money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I could I could go on and on with this, my experiences, but uh, I don't know. Fair enough. <laughs> Questions? Oh. Okay, go ahead, go for it. Sorry for asking so many, but, um, you know, you come from punk rock, and, and and the way that you all started was so just like, make a comic, let's make a comic, let's print it, like, whatever. You're just doing whatever you could with what's around you. Um, I see you, at least on social media and stuff, supporting a whole lot of different artists, whether it's just showing up to their stuff or being friends with them or whatever, and I think that's really, really cool, like, you know, Helen Joe and other folks who are working in zines and non-digital mediums. But I wonder, given the punk rock DIY ethos, if you know, if you were telling someone who's starting comics today, like, what would be a way to go about it? Would it be self-publishing? Would it be um, zines? Would it be trying to just put stuff online? Yeah. Um, like, is, is there a, an, a, a, an equivalent to, that, to the punk rock way that you all started making comics today? Or is, or is this not even something you think about? Well, uh, when you think of it like the zine, the zine world of comics, the, the minis, mm -hmm. as they call it. I don't know if they still call them that. But um, if you think of it, that's, they're doing exactly that. They're, they're doing it themselves. They're, they're printing it themselves. They're, um, you know, they're getting it out there the way, any way they can, you know. So, so I think that's cool, you know, they, that it kind of frees them from this corporate part of comics, you know, where, where it's like, well, I want to draw my own and I just want to do it. And it was kind of how we were. We were just, we just had no support system. Now, now there's like whole different parts of the comics industry that's just just the DIY do-it-yourself thing. And then, and then uh, later there's gonna, someone's gonna come up and do another one. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just cool. It's just, I think, uh, and I say this every five years or so, but this is the best time ever for for the comic book medium because you can do you can go high you can go low but you can do your own you can be an artist who's a terrible writer so if you want to go work for get matched up with a, a writer or if you want to just do uh, covers for Marvel or if you just want to or if you just want to do it by yourself you know it's just it's just it's just the coolest time, and I think there are more comics and and creators than there ever has been in the history of comics. And like you were saying earlier, it's just nothing like comics because it's so economical. If you have no money, you can still do them. <laughs> you know, if you have no, uh, I don't know if you. It, it's just you like, don't have to be a master of craft for example to yeah. still do comics yeah yeah you know? and you can like I'm gonna do my comic if uh, 
you know, I'll find someone to support, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, you know, I know a lot of people, a lot of young kids um, go to, uh, go to shows and they take their zines and they don't even sell them, they just trade with other artists who are tabling and stuff like that. That's, you know, that's, that's cool. Um, if you want to get rich, you got to find a way to get rich, but, but there is ways. There's, there's so many different ways than, than, uh, than there used to be, especially in 1981 when we started, you know. Um, and I don't know. It's just like that's why comics are the best things on earth because there's no bounds. There's no, no boundaries. You just... Oh, I don't want to do what they're doing. I'm going to do this one. Okay, you do it. You know, it's cool. It's just best. Do you feel that there's a, enough people following in your footsteps, be it slice of life material, be it Latino creators, uh, or or do you think that the market maybe co-ops itself towards more fantastical ideas? Right. Uh, sh sometimes, sometimes I think we're one in a thousand of the same comic. Sometimes I feel like the loneliest comic in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, just, mm -hmm. just uh, how the approach, how to look at it, how, how. Um, I don't know. It's just. Uh, I don't remember the question. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you I think you answered that that pretty okay there. Uh, there was a question all the way in the back. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi, Jim. Um, big fan of yours for the longest time. And one of the things about your work which is really compelling to me is how effortlessly it seems that everything flows. Like it does, nothing seems out of character. It all seems like the the plot derives out of the direct actions of what these characters decide and uh, that to me is really really compelling. But have you ever been in a position where there's been a story you wanted to tell? Because you've written so many different genres and different kinds of stories, but has there been something that you struggled with? Has there been a story which you haven't been able to tell? Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of the one, but there have been times where I, like, one day I would love to do a story about this. I just don't have enough reference I don't have the energy to to put in three years of work for for that. I know what I want, but I don't know how to get there. Kind of. So some sometimes it's that. Like there was a there was a time uh, after Maggie was um, after Maggie quit being a mechanic. I still wanted to do a mechanic story of the characters that remained. And I wanted to tell this long story about just this story about these mechanics trying to get to do something, get something done, yet all these obstacles happen and, and go through this adventure. I think it was that, that movie, uh, Wages of Fear. Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? Yeah, when I saw Wages of Fear, I go, that's how I would want to do a mechanic story. Mm. I would want to do it like, th just, just like, like this. But um, this has already been made, <laughs> you know? And I'm not the type that would just take that and, take, and turn it into my thing and then take credit for it. You know, I, I, I go, Wages of Fear is done. It's made. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. What would mine be about? You know, and so it just never, never gelled. But I always had that dream. Oh, just a straight story about these mechanics, these rocket mechanics that go through this long, sad story, or or whatever. You know, you know, just things like that. But um, it's rare. You know. You know? Yeah, so a lot of it's just lazy. <laughs> like, I don't want to draw that whole thing. Then I would have to draw a thing. I would have to draw yeah. trucks. I would have to draw... <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. right. I had a question. So, the, you know, uh, the locale is based upon your 
your where you grew up, right? But I was wondering if any of the characters are based upon real characters. Um, rarely one ca- one person. It's usually uh, like a person's personality, uh, a person's hair style. Sometimes, sometimes it's simply that just a person's hair color. You know, uh, um, like a character like Hopi came a lot from someone I know. Her fireball attitude came from someone that was really close to me. So um, while I wasn't drawing this person, I just put their soul into into Hopi. Uh, I uh, um, like my character Doyle. He uh, he came from kind of a look I liked of a friend, how he wore his hair and stuff. But by the time I drew him, I created his. He had his own personality. He wasn't anything like that person, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, no one. And then Maggie is the least of everybody because she's a million people. In one, in this one character, yeah, and I think that's why she's the easiest to write because she is just a million people in this one person. That Doyle piece in the book is really good. The spring 1982. Oh, the, the, the uh, oh yeah. But it's like a, just a three pager, no? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so since you brought it up, I'm curious to hear which uh, other works, uh, other creators in non-comics mediums you're you're looking at and saying that's inspirational or that gets right. your juices flowing. Um, a lot less than when I was younger. Huh. You know, when I was in my twenties, I would discover certain movies. You know. Um, uh, I didn't even know who the directors were, <laughs> you know, but there were certain movies that just inspired me to lean a certain way. But by the time I put it down on paper, it wasn't that anymore. It was just kind of a this driving thing that that wanted me to get there. I remember uh, really early on, I did this long story called A Hundred Rooms, and it's where Maggie and her friends stay in this this mansion. This vast mansion where there's no, no uh, end to this building. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do the architecture of the movie um, *Son of Frankenstein*, because <laughs> the architecture is really wacky in it. I mean, just like uh, beams shooting out of the wall and and, and stuff and and. I kind of wanted to do that. By the time I drew it, I was too lazy to f- try to figure out, uh, like, like I got to do architecture. <laughs> nah. So I hid. I hid most of the story in shadows. And I didn't know that I was borrowing from the film noir directors, who had no budget, so they used lighting to make things, uh, you know, interesting. I didn't know I was copying that, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. There's just been movies since I was a little kid that that inspired me um, to to want to do something. But by the time I did it, it was the characters took it a different way, you know. Yeah. Makes so. sense. Same in, in comics as well. Like, who are you reading today? Oh, today I don't read that many comics today. I don't, um, it's weird. I, I'm so, I'm so into my own head that, that very little penetrates. If anything is going to penetrate, it's, uh, I will read a comic that somebody does and I will go, oh, I like the pacing in this. It's it's slower than my comics. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should slow down a little bit, let, let it breathe more. And then sometimes I'll read another one and I go, wow, they're just blasting through the wall here. Uh, maybe I should step it up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's usually like a, 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 
a beat thing, you know. And uh, so uh, sometimes I don't even like the comic that I got that idea from, sure. <laughs> you know. But but uh, you know, a lot of times, like like I remember when uh, uh, Harvey Pekar was doing comics before we were, yet I didn't know who he was till later. Um, and when I saw American Splendor, and I saw that he was just doing real time, and he was just him thinking about stuff, and not, and it was just moving snail's pace. Uh, I remember liking that, and like, oh, he gives he gives time to breathe, the characters time to breathe. So that taught me a lot about pacing and 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 slowing down, and capturing mood through time. You know, um, so it, was, it yeah, it'd be like that. You know, so um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was never. I never tried to. Well, by the time Love and Rockets came out, I didn't try to emulate artists. I just wanted their soul. I was just trying to <laughs> sure. capture mm -hmm. the soul of what work they were doing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. If you see, if you notice in the 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 very first issue I'm just coming out of my Mobius my Mobius uh, era when I was uh, like trying to ink like Mobius or Barry Windsor Smith or something like that you know uh, but um, but um, that but that was pretty soon just was taken out of Love and Rockets I just I became I got more comfortable with what I was doing, you know. And, and I have to jump on this because you, you, you brought it up, but since you said emulate Love and Rockets, did the band ever get in touch with you? They said they did. <laughs> they were already recording by the time we heard about it, about them. And we kind of sent, I don't remember who we talked to, but we sent a message going, look, guys, this is our name, this is our identity. I wish you wouldn't do this. Uh, you're rock stars, you know, they just didn't care, you know. It was kind of like uh, all my life, punk bands have been stealing my art for their covers and stuff like that. And when you call them on it, they just, they, every time they go, it's just a comic. Yeah. And I'll yeah. go, all right, okay. And then, and then, and I think it's funny because a lot of, um, a lot of those bands that would just use my art over and over again, take it from a f flyer or whatever and put it on their cover or whatever, make t-shirts and stuff. Now now they're all mad and suing their record labels for screwing them over and I'm like, <laughs> you guys, okay? Now it's your turn. You know, but, yeah. I wanted to ask you about how the nature of serialization changes or doesn't change your storytelling. Particularly, I'm thinking about how uh, Love and Rockets was serialized annually for a number of years. And you were talking at lunch about how, how both of you felt really kind of uh, constrained by that at the end. Yeah. Um, and now that it's back on a more quarterly schedule, suddenly you have to produce pages like that or else the magazine doesn't come out. So. How does that change how you construct the stories and what the stories are? Um, it's it's uh, it's just basically you know you work within how much you got. I've okay. got sixteen pages. Gilbert's got sixteen pages. Um, you find out what works best in that space. If you want to tell something longer, then you go, oh, I guess I'm going to have to continue this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, I like thinking in the shorter spurts because when we were doing the annual, by the end of it, we were kind of really uh, going crazy. We were like, like, I can't live with 100 pages for a year. I can't do it. I need closure. I... I I always liked that Love and Rockets in the beginning was you you did a four page story you were done you did a you know uh, uh, 
you did the amount of pages you had, and then it came out, and you were like, ah, a new issue. Oh, boy, I feel great. I can't wait to get to the next one. Mm -hmm. When I was living with 100 pages, it was like, all right, I've got 40 so far. <laughs> what do I do? On the good hand, it was, it was that, oh, I've got time to breathe. I've got time to, to tell my story more spread out. That was a good part, mm -hmm. but, but, and I learned a lot that way. Um, but the bad part was I was rewriting scenes that didn't need to be rewritten because I thought they were old and tired. Right. And I go, and then I was realizing, wait a minute, people haven't even seen this, and I'm changing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when I started to go, oh no, okay, I got to, we got to do something. And it wasn't until the eighth issue that I remember uh, Gilbert and I were in a show or something, doing a show, and and we were talking about, yeah, yeah, the eighth issue just came out. And, and I heard Gilbert under his breath go, boy, that one killed me. And I, and I looked at him, and I go, really? Really? Like, you too? And he goes, oh, yeah, this is killing me. And I went, Hey, let's go back. <laughs> let's let's do the comic again. Mm -hmm. You know, doing it short because uh, we. I, I thought it was just me. Yeah. You know, but. I think as a reader, I'd also say I prefer the quarterly. You know, the annual is just like trying to remember what happened a, a year ago. Or yeah, yeah. that that I went on. Uh, I went on like Twitter and Instagram because I didn't want characters to. For, I mean, characters. I didn't want readers to forget me. That, like, in a year later, like, like, uh, are, does this guy do comics anymore? I was like, here I am, you know. But. I wonder too, because I mean, I think that, in a lot of ways, the, being able to tell a story in a short amount of pages is more of a skill than having as many pages as you want. I, does that is does that parse at all, or am I am I off base? I could totally be off base. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes it's better. Sometimes, it's not. Like I said, the the hundred pages taught me how to expand. Mm -hmm. ta taught me how to breathe more. Um, but the short ones I enjoyed because they were just it was it was like a spurt, and then you were done yeah. and free to do, to create something new again. Um, I'm teaching myself to shorten my stories mm. again. Like this, this uh, new issue I'm doing right now, um, I'm like, okay, I got this idea where these people are doing this and then these people are, are doing this. And I go, oh, why don't I just do it in parts? Why don't I do that that first part, just a four pager, and then it ends, and then it continues in a whole different kind of uh, mood, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm I'm teaching myself again how to do things in short, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's I'm learning all over again. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know. When you when you put together a package in a book like this. I, because I've never actually gone and looked, kind of compared the serialization to the book. How much are you, do you go through and go, I've got to reshape this work a little bit? I've got to add a little bit here. Oh, I, you know, I can put a page in here. Or do you just let, let the work go out um, as, you, as you made it at this I'm point? I'm usually thinking about that before, mm. before that amount of mm -hmm. story is mm -hmm. finished. Okay. Because I do admit, I think about c collections now when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I do think about it being collected in a, in a package. You know, we didn't used to think that sure. way. You know, it was just fly, just whatever, whatever, here's, here's this and that. And Does I, that change the stories? It, uh, yeah, it, it sometimes creates a bigger, uh, bigger, story mm -hmm, bigger mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know um, sometimes like I said I, I just want to draw a four pager and then it, it's over mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and then move on to something else mm -hmm. but uh, I do think in the 
bigger scope now. I, I do think like, uh, like uh, these Tonta stories were at first just supposed to be teenage romps. You know, oh, poor Tonta, mm -hmm. you know. And then the next story. But as, they st as the, c the characters start to write themselves, they start to, everything starts to connect. Like mm -hmm. that first mm -hmm. story is now connecting with this fifth story, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then that's when I start to think about it in the bigger package, mm -hmm. you know. Is it, I know, this is a stupid question maybe, but is it difficult to think kind of fourth dimensionally like that? I mean, where you're, you're trying to do the work that's in front of you, but it's also like this three year thing, you know? There's, there's always something in the back of my head that's thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I'll, as I'm doing whatever I am there, I'm always thinking ahead, mm -hmm. you know, what's to come. Sometimes I don't know what that is, but I it's open. Right. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, in the back. So are the um, surreal, more sci-fi stories, are they a way to break away from that like overarching story you have going with the more realistic ones? You know, like with the realistic ones, you know, the Hopi Maggie, the, all those characters that you're thinking about how they act. Like with the more sci-fi ones, are you able to just to work a different way? Yeah, it's it's kind of freeing myself from uh, continuity. Maggie and Hopi's world is so tight, so like grounded in Earth that sometimes I hate them. <laughs> you know, like like I don't even like these characters right now. So I get a break when I get to draw, you know. A woman biting someone's head off, or you know, just and because it, it's just free, it just frees me. And then I do want to get back to the other stuff. Um, that's why I'm doing doing the the Maggie yeah. Hopi seri serious stuff, and then I have the Princess Anima yeah. stuff because that has no has less rules. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so that's exactly why I do it. I just need a break or I'll go crazy, you know. And I don't want to, I don't want the characters to suffer because I'm not happy doing it, you know. The minute I'm unhappy doing something, I do something else. You know? Makes sense. Please. Um, how much time do you spend at your desk each day? Like in my mind, I imagine you at your desk every day uninterrupted, like going to like a chamber. Um, and also, was there ever a time in your life where, like for an extended period, you wanted to create, but you couldn't either when you were newly a parent or you um, had writer's block? Right. Was there ever a time like that? Um, to tell you the truth, most of my days, I'm sitting there with a blank piece of paper, and I'm, and I find ways of distracting myself, you know, and then before I, before I know it, I haven't worked in two weeks. And I'm like, oh, oh. yeah. Um, it, but you put in the time you sit at your desk. Uh, I try to, you know. And then I get up and turn on the TV and watch old game shows or, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, yeah, I try to discipline myself, but I've, I find that I've been doing this so long a certain way that um, it can only come when it comes. I can't make it, I can't make, make it happen. It has to happen. And I spend a lot of time waiting for that to happen. And I'm not, I've never disciplined myself enough to structure it where it works for everybody. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just how, it's kind of like I'm waiting, like, okay, any time now, you know. Um, and it's, it's, that's the hard part of it. I can't make it happen. It has to just happen. And I'll find myself a week later, and I'm, I've done, like, pencil like three pages and I'm really into this story and I go what how what happened from the time 
I was just sitting there with my arms folded to this. What? I don't know what, what turned it over, you know. It's, it's, I work very strange, just like I said earlier. I, uh, that's why I could never teach this stuff, because it just happens, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. You're newly a parent, or are you? Sure. I usually store it in my head. I used to, in my head, and but I'm finding out that well, I'm 59 years old, and that's no excuse. But I'm finding that I will have a a a great, brilliant idea while I'm driving, and I go, I can't wait to get it when I'm home. It's gone by the time I get <laughs> home. I used to be able to store it better. And I'm sure there's ways I could work it where I could get that back, but but I, it makes me sad. Like I had this great, perfect idea, and I don't remember what it was. Ish. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's uh, it can be very painful and <laughs> difficult for me. There are people who can get up in the morning, get to their drawing board, and just start working. And more power to him. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> um, any last questions? We're pretty much at two hours. Here, go ahead. Um, I hate to ask this, but you know how it's all going to end. <laughs> uh, I'll die. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Um, no, I, I picture, I can picture some characters disappearing. Uh, I can picture some of them being very old, but I don't have a story written for that. I just can picture, like, uh, I don't know, Maggie being very old, but I don't know how, where, or, or what. Um, I don't know. I. I I don't know. Um, they're, they've been aging with me for so long that it's kind of like I still have the strength to get up in the morning and do stuff. So do they, I guess. Um, you know. So I don't know. I, it's just. Are they are they keeping you alive, or are you keeping them alive? <laughs> It's a compromise. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Very good. Um, obviously, I, you know, normally there's a point where I, I say, well, what are you working on next? And, well, you're working on Love and Rockets next. Right. Right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, anything other than just, just the normal course of, of work? or uh, Right now, I'm doing a drawing for a singer, a T-shirt drawing. Um, uh, it's in just in uh, pencil stages. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not a lot. No. Um, what, they, what percentage of your work is is or your time is put to doing that kind of a commission kind of work? Um, it used to be uh, a bigger percentage than it is now. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I don't take a lot of work no. outside work. I just. No. I'm. I'm just so. Uh, into my thing that it's kind of like I don't want to do that other thing, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, Gilbert just turned down a big, a pretty good book deal, and he said uh, he told me, uh, "I'm." Uh, he goes, "I turned it. I just called him at the last minute. And go, I'm not going to do this." Yeah. And I was like, "Really? That would have been pretty good money, you know." And he goes, he goes, I don't want to draw something uh, someone else's thing anymore. Yeah. He goes, I just want to draw Love and Rockets. Yeah. And I go, yep, we're both going to end up very poor old men. <laughs> 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 you know, but, but it's true. I, I just want to draw what I want to draw. Yeah. And well, the greatest joy is to be able to wake up and, and do what you want to do, you know, every day and set the course of your own destiny. And, yeah. You know, certainly I, you're, you're able to do that with this. It, sort of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're a master cartoonist, and um, I'm pretty sure everybody else in this room would think the same thing. 
Um, I want to thank you for Tonta, but also for your whole body of work, your, the corpus of it. Um, uh, you are a fantastic cartoonist, and I hope that you draw as long as you want to keep doing it. I, you know, like, I, I, once you hit 50, it's like it starts becoming a curse if you like. I hope you do it as much as you do. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, <laughs> the scary part is now I can count the, yeah. I can count the years now. Yeah. Like, how many do I have left? Yeah. Yeah. You still got plenty, though, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm still good. Yeah. I, I always, uh, for some reason, my turning 60 this year, I'm going to, I'm, this is the first time a decade has panicked me. Right. You know, because usually at 30, yeah. big deal. 40, yeah. big deal. Yeah. 50, hey, that was fun. Yeah. You know, uh, 60, this is the first time I was uh, yeah. like, like, oh, my God, 60. Oh, my God. And then, uh, and then I, I realized no. When I tr- as soon as I turn sixty, I'm not going to care. Yeah. yeah, you know, it'll just start again. Exactly. Start. start exactly. Again. But right now, yeah, I'm just kind of like, I'm getting old. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you for the book. I want to thank you for coming out and talking to us. Uh, I want to thank everybody here in the audience for coming out on a Wednesday night and, and sitting and talking with us. Um, I want to thank Fanagraphics for publishing this. I want to thank The Beat for sponsoring us. Uh, www.comicsbeat.com. It's the best news site for comic news and information as far as I'm concerned. Um, so so go there and, and thank them for supporting the book club. Uh, our book this month was uh, Tonta. Uh, uh, Jaime Hernandez here. Next month's book... Um, is uh, is the new world um, by uh, David? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Jesus or Jesus uh, Vignoli, um, and this is a, this is you guys are going to really like this. It's you'll note the second book that's called the New World that we've had this year that also has a red cover. So I think that we figured out <laughs> we've cracked the code for what the staff likes. It's books that would have red covers that are called the New World. That's all you need to do to get in, in the book club. Um, but this will be uh, next month's book. And uh, what's do we do we do we look at the date? What yes, is it? It's September fifteenth at ten a.m. September fifteenth at ten a.m. Because and it's a Sunday morning and it's because he's in the UK and so I couldn't get him to do a nighttime one because it would be like four in the morning or something. So yeah, next month's uh, meeting is at ten a.m. on a Sunday. Um, I still hope you guys come out and make it because I don't like being here all by myself. <laughs> um, it's no fun. Uh, but thank you all for coming out and thank you, Jaime, so much for Thanks. taking this time and speaking with us. We love you very much. And that's the Graphic Novel Month uh, uh, for this month. We'll see you next month. <laughs>